So welcome everybody. I'm very, very excited to be launching um, Fertility Futures, um, an online feminist forum to talk about research in the area of fertility, um, an area of longstanding feminist concern, but also an area of quite considerable social change right now, and an area where there's a lot of very, very exciting feminist research. So um, I'm uh, Sarah Franklin, Director of the Reproductive Sociology Research Group at the University of Cambridge, um, where I had the incredibly wonderful opportunity to work with today's guest, Sigrid Vertemann, who's currently a um, postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Conflict and Development Studies at the University of Ghent, um, and was previously a, a postdoctoral researcher at Cambridge in the Reproductive Sociology Research Group. Um, and I was always very, very struck by uh, Ziggy's research, um, both the breadth of it, the ambition of it, and the amount of it. Um, and I've learned an incredible amount from her work, both from the empirical work um, and from the um, theoretical directions that uh, Ziggy has really mapped out um, for us. So that's going to be the topic of our conversation today. And Siggy, so, yeah, I wanted to maybe just start um, by asking you to say a little bit about how did you get interested in the reproduction area? Hi, Sarah. Thanks uh, so much for, um, yeah, for having this chat with me. It's an honor to kick off the, the podcast series. Um, yeah, and to be having this hopefully uh, like informal and, and, and an interesting conversation together. <laughs> Um, so it's a it's a good question on how I got interested in fertility because when you know when writing the introduction to my PhD dissertation you kind of have to make this deconstruction like almost psychoanalytically of how you got interested in uh, in in the topic um, and I think I I got interested in fertility um, through Israel Palestine actually. So um, I, I did my PhD at the, at the Department of Conflict and Development Studies at the Middle East and North Africa Research Group. Um, so I had to basically uh, choose a PhD topic um, that you know, looked at the region, the Middle East and North Africa. And until then, the only the country where I had been before was Israel-Palestine. So it's actually interesting that um, uh, yeah, my interest in fertility and fertility politics and fertility technologies um, was through the lens of Israel-Palestine. Um, and I think what I've tried to do in my PhD project was, was use the lens of reproduction and fertility to kind of make sense of Israel-Palestine as a colonial and a biocapitalist project, and vice versa, to also use um, the lens of Israel-Palestine and what a colonial project is today to understand what fertility and fertility technologies and fertility markets today are. Um, so I think, yeah, this double lens of using Israel-Palestine to understand how fertility is working today in the 21st century, but also the other way around, to see what um, histories of, of empire, of conquest, of demographic settlement, of capital accumulation uh, that are happening in many places of the world, but also in Israel-Palestine in a very, um, particular way. Um, I think that's also a really important lens, um, specter or you know, uh, looking glass as you frame it, to, 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 to understand that fertility is a lot more than just you know, making babies and um, uh, biology and, and nature. So yeah, I think this is how I initially got interested in fertility. And then later, because I think I've I've been, a, I've, I identify as a feminist since I'm like 18 or so. Um, so obviously I've, I've always been interested in issues of um, labor, motherhood, uh, bodies, biologies, and how they define um, womanhood in a way, in a very, not in an essentialist way, but in a very socially uh, constructed way as well. Um, so I think putting these things together and feminist interest and engagement together with an interest in Israel-Palestine kind of shaped my first, um, yeah, um, Im uh, immersement in the field of, of fertility studies, I think. What a wonderful, wonderful way to start us off, Ziggy, because that is a really brilliant description of 
what's very special about your work and as you said reproduction and fertility they're so often associated with you know individual private decisions or with having children um and with ideas about the biological and um it's a long-standing feminist complaint really that reproduction has never been sort of at the center um and that if you put reproduction at the center you know things start to look very different and all sorts of things that you know normally don't count um like reproductive labor suddenly become much more um fundamental or elementary to how we understand the social order or the social disorder whichever we'll, we'll get onto that um and of course the other really key term for you um is political economy and that was obviously a very major influence on you um, and you wrote this wonderful chapter called Marx in Utero. <laughs> and I was just, I love that title so much, Marx in Utero. It's, I mean, it's so brilliant. It's such a great way to, you know, really like put the question on the table, Marx in Utero. Um, so can you just tell me a little bit like what difference does it make, you know, to put Marx in Utero or to put Utero in Marx? Um, yeah, so that chapter was, um... Um, a contribution to a book on how uh, Marxist um, methods and epistemologies can help us um, in doing field work today, um, and as well how field work or empirically based qualitative research can also help to uh, nuance, refine, or basically reject, uh, you know, the Marxist uh, theories and, and you know sometimes also uh, dogmas. Um, so yeah, I wanted to bring. Um, you know, the research that we've been doing in ReproSoc and, and, you know, where fertility reproduction is put center stage. So I wanted to, to, put, to bring that into the, a chapter on, 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 on contemporary views of Marxism and Marxist methodologies. So rather than looking at the sweatshop or, you know, the, the, the plantation or the, um, you know, many other sites of quite classic or less classic commodity production, um, I, I wanted to start from the fertility clinic and, and even, you know, even more embodied from the, from the womb, from the uterus, because my research deals with um, global fertility chains and especially uh, international surrogacy and egg donation. Um, so yeah, so that was what the, 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 chapter, the chapter was about. Well, that brings me to, um, you know, the related question, which is that when, we're using reproduction. We have these inherited terms around, you know, biology and women and fertility and so forth. Um, and um, when we have political economy, we also have um, a sort of inherited set of terms, including production and reproduction, mode of production, mode of reproduction, and also, yeah, commodity, labor, division of labor, etc. Um, and so the challenge you know for putting Marx in utero or putting utero in Marx is that we're not only using the fertility clinic instead of the plantation um, or thinking about what the plantation means from a point of view of fertility say um, but um, we're also needing to sort of rework some of those terms we have to use them and rework them at the same time it's always a challenge for feminist research. Um, and one of the key terms that you've um, introduced is the idea of the reproductive industrial complex. Um, <laughs> this is a very, very important term to your work. It's a very important term for our field. And I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about that concept and where it comes from, but also maybe just a little bit about how do you um use the term but like repurpose the term at the same time because that phrase does that instead of military industrial complex it's reproductive and that and in israel of course that means a very particular thing but at the same time industrial complex you know it carries a certain sort of history with it so how do you deal with that challenge i i introduced the term and it was actually um in a paper um, that was part of my PhD project on Israel-Palestine. So in my PhD, I looked at the political economy of assisted reproduction in Israel-Palestine. And I looked in you know, the various chapters of the PhD, I kind of looked at a different reproductive technology and I tried to, uh, to see how it uh, materialized in Israel-Palestine. 
um, at these intersecting logics of um, capital accumulation. So you know how it how it is immersed in biocapitalist projects of 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 value and surplus value creation. So a quite classic uh, political e political economy pro um, approach. Um, but on the other hand, what has also been very crucial in in my understanding of the reproductive reproductive industrial complex is how it has these older histories and older um, lineages um, of, of, of ongoing processes of colonialism um, um, and demographic replacement um, in, in Israel-Palestine. So the, the point I wanted to make in this article was that you know, Israel is quite famous for a, a very technologically um, advanced um, uh, high-tech industry and also a biotech industry. Um, and this has often been explained by, um, you know, looking at neoliberalism and how um, Israel kind of emerged as the as, as the startup nation, yeah, as this very technologically advanced startup nation. Um, and, and what has been often overlooked is this, you know, how this project of capital accumulation could also could only uh, take shape within what I argue a colonial project of demographic replacement. So it's kind of trying to understand that these logics of capital um, accumulation are not these, you know, it doesn't only happen through uh, this classic Marxist view of commodity production through productive labor in the factory by, you know, often um, male scientists or male doctors, but that, are, that there are other um, spheres <laughs> um, that need to be included in our analysis. And that's not only the sphere of, um, yeah, patriarchy, let's say, where women's waged and unwaged reproductive labor has always been seen as something that is totally external from the commodity uh, production process, but also these uh, colonial histories when certain bodies, certain natures of and, and, and colonized and enslaved peoples have also been presented as something that is external to the process of capital accumulation. So it's trying to have this more integrative approach on what um, the global fertility industry is, um, and that it's not only a product of technological, technoscientific advancements, um, and even you know um, neoliberal processes of, of financialization, but there are these older histories that we need to take into account uh, to make sense of um, you know which bodies, which knowledges, which natures can be uh, can be appropriated. It's, it's about also the processes of appropriation that are needed within. Um, present-day capitalism, I think. That's a very, very clear answer. And what's really, I think, very powerful about your work, Siggy, is that you know you don't just answer that question in the abstract. You don't just answer it in sort of quite overarching analytic terms, which you could do and which some people do do. Um, you went to the fertility clinic. And you know, you're know you part of a group of scholars who have been incredibly innovative in how you've researched the transactions involved in fertility now. And you've redefined what fertility is for the state and for a militarized state um, by tracking these transactions. When Nihal Nauman was tracking egg donation, she talked about reverse egg donation, sort of the um, travel of um, Israeli um, couples to other countries to, um, to, to, um, to create a pregnancy that was a kind of almost microcosm of a larger world order. Um, and, and I think to even say that, to create a pregnancy that's a microcosm of a larger world order is a whole new way of thinking about um, how pregnancies are established. But um, you could say all pregnancies are established as part of a world order, which would sort of be the point of what a lot of Reposak is saying. But anyway, um, exactly. can you just say a little bit about, because what, because it's very interesting to me and always been very, very interesting to me about your work, Ziggy, is that you don't just make the case at this very abstract level, you followed the eggs. <laughs> so can you just tell me a little bit about, okay, so you went to the fertility clinic and then what did you do? So the, as I said, the PhD project was on, on Israel-Palestine, and I kind of looked at not only um, egg donation, but various reproductive technologies. So um, one of them was um, in vitro fertilization, one was surrogacy, uh, transnational surrogacy, one was transnational egg donation, and also national egg donation in Israel. Um, one was sperm smuggling, so um, 
Palestinian political prisoners who are smuggling their sperm out of um, um, Israeli prisons in an attempt to, um, you know, still make families. Um, and another one was the, um, the, you know, the very controversial case of the, the kidnapping of Mizrahi Jewish children in the in the fifties in in a similar way as. Um, you know, the stolen generations in Australia or what happened in Canada with the um, many half half breed uh, children who were taken away from their birth mothers and birth families. So I kind of looked at various older and newer reproductive um, technologies and kind of looked how they yeah, materialized uh, in Israel, Palestine. So um, I did field work for like six years um, in Israel, Palestine, and I didn't only visit fertility clinics, but I also had uh, a lot of interviews with um, stem cell scientists, um, biotech entrepreneurs, um, technology transfer uh, units of universities, um, you know, representatives of, of the ministries of health. Um, also, with, I did interviews with the wives of the political prisoners who smuggled their sperm out of prison. So I kind of had a, um, a very broad uh, area of, 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 of sites where I conducted my field work. And for me, it was crucial to not only, um, yeah, especially for Israel-Palestine, to go to both sides of the green line. So to the interviews with the wives of the Palestinian political prisoners, were mostly in uh, the West Bank, while the interviews with stem cell scientists, fertility clinics were mostly in, um, in, in, in Israel. Um, so for me, that was important to, to do both. Um, and it was mostly interview based. So I did observations in the fertility clinics and um, uh, in, some in a few stem cell companies, um, but I mostly did, um, did interviews with, you know, um, uh, a lot of actors that are relevant in these global fertility chains. And then for my postdoc projects, I kind of looked at one of these reproductive technologies, which was transnational surrogacy. Um, and I kind of used it to, to see how Israel-Palestine is not this, you know, local colonial project, but that it's that it has, you know, that it's articulated in a global way. Um, so I when I was start starting my postdoc, many Israeli couples were actually um, recruiting uh, foreign uh, surrogates and egg donors in an attempt to have biologically related children. So at that time, many of the egg donors came from South Africa or Ukraine, and many of the uh, surrogates were recruited by um, you know, Israeli fertility companies in countries like Georgia, but also Mexico, um, uh, Cambodia, uh, Nepal, etc. So I decided to kind of um, also, yeah, connect Israel-Palestine to the globe and the fertility politics that were happening in Israel-Palestine to connect it to the, the rest of the globe and follow one particular chain. So for me, the chain that I was interested in was Israel-Palestine, uh, Ukraine um, for egg donation and uh, surrogacy in uh, Georgia. And yeah, the point that I wanted to make as well is that it's, um, to understand how the global fertility industry today operates, um, it's it's not only necessary to you know to to do empirically based research in one specific country, um, but to also do research along the collaborative research, preferably along the chain. Um, so that's why, as a postdoc scholar, I also became a lot more co collaborative in you know co-authoring with many other people. Um, um, so, for instance. Um, I work together a lot with Michal Nachman, who has done research in Romania and in Spain. Um, I also collaborated with Vincenzo Pavone, who's done research on Spain, in a way to kind of see how these different fertility hubs um, are connected in, a, in, in, a, in global fertility chains. Um, so I think this kind of was, a, yeah, was reminded me of the importance of doing multi-sided and collaborative collaborative fieldwork rather than being a lone researcher who you know who tries to do everything uh, by herself by going to a place and going to the fertility clinics and 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 um, etc that too is a really inspiring description of the work you do and um it was very inspiring to me in in putting together the welcome project that you and i are both part of now which is a comparative 
project of changing infertilities across the globe with um, with over 40 scholars in 20 different countries now. And I, I completely agree with you. I think the case study approach and then being put into a comparative frame is very, very important for us to see not only what's happening within each context and what's very specific about how fertility is being constituted, how it's being capitalized, you know, how it's being integrated into the state apparatus in ways that aren't always obvious, et cetera, et cetera, how that is, is happening because of the specificity of that location. At the same time, we might wanna be able to draw some generalizations about how that's happening across different sites. I think that's really the challenge for us right now. And you've been very, very innovative and productive in the way that you've taken those questions forward. So I just wanna um, push that a little further because um, you know, one of the key um, models you use, like you said, is the, is the idea of the fertility chain mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the way you know, we can do something here that we can't do there. So we do this part of it here, but then we do that part of it there. And the reason we can do that part of it there and this part of it here is because of a larger stratified global economic, you know, bordered, not flat world. Um, and, um, and the fact that you were in Israel and Palestine to, to begin with, where, like you said, the green line was crucial to your research means that on the one hand, you're looking at the chain but on the other hand, you're looking at the border. So you're kind uh -huh. of almost looking at the broken chain, like the chain that works because it overcomes the links that are broken by borders that prevent um, certain things happening here, you know, that mean you have to go there. Um, and I just wondered if you could say a little bit I know it's a kind of a big question, but uh -oh. um, <laughs> why is it in, why is it important to understand the chain not just as a series of like what you might call identical links, but in fact the chain is kind of almost like a different link in each place. Do you know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. um, that's really what you're tracking. You're tracking why the chain. Um, the chain of movement, the chain of of the travel of of people and 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 cells and money and um, and and expertise, etc., is um, is is part of a discontinuous set of mm -hmm. links. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I remember when. Um... The, the term actually fertility chains was um, came out of a discussion with Barbara Prinsek, who was my uh, my mentor in my, my supervisor in uh, my when I was doing my my postdoc fellowship at, at King's and who has been a very helpful um, and 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 inspiring uh, supervisor. It was the first time I worked so closely with um, a, a, a woman supervisor. Um, and there was something so nurturing um, about that collaboration with Barbara. Although we are very different people, also we have probably also very different opinions about many things. And still, um, yeah, I found her actually, yeah, um, the two the two postdocs I did in in the UK, both with uh, with Barbara and and also one with you at Reprostock. I will I remember this as both yeah very nurturing and caring. Um, uh, yeah, um, environments to to work in, um, in, in in a good feminist uh, feminist spirit. Anyway, I'm digressing. Uh, so when we first uh, came up with the term, I remember that Barbara. It was also something that was a bit like catchy, um, and it took me a while to also think like, why do I use, for instance, global fertility chains and not global fertility networks or global fertility assemblages? Because there are so many ways to kind of um, you know, to make these ontological claims on on how on, on 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 how movement works and how things flow in the global fertility industry or in the reproductive bioeconomy, um, and still I think 
I insisted on, uh, and later we developed this idea as well in, uh, with, with, Mich with Michal Nachman and with Vincenzo Pavone, we kind of talked about it as well, like why do we use the chain? Why do we insist on the chain? Because it's actually indebted to this quite old school world system analysis literature on commodity chains um, that you know, bring in a lot of interesting per perspectives of how global capitalism operates, but also focuses very um, well, narrowly on the commodity, right? And, and, and sometimes fails to bring in these other um, reproductive spheres of the family, the household, the body that we as feminist scholars always found very important. Um, and I think why we insisted on the chain um, is because in other, um, in other, how do you call these conceptualizations of how these global travels eh, or flows work, um, I think um, maybe also in assemblage or or a and um, um, actor network theory, there is kind of it almost it almost is represent is presented as a as a as a as a flat ontology between all these different human and non-human actors who all have kind of the same you know in an in a, in a, how do you, how do you call this who are who's who, where the power hierarchies between these different elements actants in the in the in the network in the assemblage are not clearly articulated and i think where i still consider myself to be like yeah a marxist <laughs> is that i do i do want to take into account these structural logics that are at play in, uh, you know, in within in capitalism and in uh, settler colonialism and in slavery, where uh, there are certain logics of 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 appropriation of exploitation, um, you know, that are that are structural, that are not just contingent. And I think the chains was still an, you know, um, an insistence on being very careful to the contingencies, to you know, do empirically based research that has. Um, that always situates situates things in their socio-historical realities that are particular, but at the same time not losing sight of the structural logics that we also cannot deny as social, social scientists. So I think that's why we insisted on the chain. Um, although you know it's open for discussion, there are many other ways to to concept movement within uh, global capitalism and the global fertility industry, but. I, I think I'm a bit wary of these more benign terms like travel, cross-border reproductive travel, or repro, you know, or, or flows, because not everything flows with the same ease in the fertility industry. Some bodies can easily, can some substances, some some bodily materials can easily flow. Some people can easily flow in the chain, in the in the you know, but others others can't. Um, I mean, I think my. The, the work I've done on the Palestinian political prisoners who who need to smuggle their sperm out of out of prison uh, to to make their you know family dreams come true in a way, I think is a very tangible um, example of of the fact that not you know travel doesn't doesn't maybe doesn't always cover the the realities in in um, and I think maybe chain. Or frontiers, you know, as as your work also um, illustrates so beautifully, are, are maybe terms that I think capture more of that the the, the structural inequalities yeah, that yeah. are at play in the global fertility industry. I'm just going to ask you one more question. Um, I want to ask you because when you talk about um, you know structural inequality and how important structural inequality is to the transaction of particular kinds of you know fertility products people services etc um and you know it's it's really essential to see what fertility is all about when we when we look at it from that point of view because it's very selective it's, you know it's fertility it's constructed in a very particular way and that is selective uh -huh. and um certain things can be here because other things can't. Um, so you, one of the most important influences in your work and another reason I've always been a big fan of your writing is your um, close and I think I can even say loving attention to traditional feminist materialist accounts, <laughs> the old fashioned feminist materialist accounts, um, uh, Maria May, Sylvia Federici, 
um, a, accounts of, of the material conditions, you know, materialist feminism in the, you know, 1970s, 1980s sense of the term. And I just wonder if you could say a little bit um, about that kind of materialist feminism. There has been a big critique, of course, of that kind of materialist feminism. I, I for one, think, um, you know, the old feminist materialism is vital. And, you know, we should definitely not be getting rid of it anytime soon. But can you just say a little bit about why it's important to you? Yeah, it is very important. And I think a lot of my, my, my work and also my activism is trying to bring these, you know, the debates and the topics that of, of so-called biological eh, fertility and reproduction and to bring these into the, the discussions, you know, the still thriving discussions of, of, of social reproduction and the, the importance of um, social reproduction in the in the creation of of, of, of surplus value and in the and in and, and profits basically, um, so I think that's like what, uh, um, uh, an important part of my work now is to bring these these two traditions of, of feminist writing to to kind of bring them together, and you know sometimes there are disagreements and there are fractions, but I think um, yeah I've always benefited a lot from this these diffractive readings between, you know, of, of, of different traditions, scholarly, uh, feminist scholarly uh, traditions. So I think it's even in, you know, within for so-called new feminist materialists or, you know, however you want to, <laughs> we want to categorize um, um, people. But I think these older debates on historical materialism um, and, you know, sexual and gender and racialized divisions of labor and, you know, on what constitutes work and what constitutes nature. And I think these are all, and, and what is labor and what is a laborer and who is not a laborer and uh, what is motherhood and is motherhood work? And all these questions remain so crucial for me. And I think for many other people in, um, in, in understanding how fertility is, is being put to work, um, you know, in our contemporary lives and, and, and you know, in, in, in the political economy, in the world economy today. So I think that really remains a very important source of inspiration for me. Um, and yeah, even though, you know, somebody like Maria Mies, who, who um, if she, I think if she would read how I use her work on housewifeization to understand the Georgian surrogacy industry, would probably not agree with me. Uh, you know, I considering her previous engagements in Findrich and even somebody like Silvia Federici has, you know, in our discussions, she, um, you know, she's very critical of, of commercial surrogacy in a way that I try to maybe develop, you know, different ideas as surrogacy as, as paid reproductive labor uh, in relation to unpaid reproductive labor. But still, uh, despite these disagreements, I think it's, it's crucial, the insights that um, this generation of, of autonomist Marxists and also a lot of black feminist uh, scholarship has, has, has brought us. And I, I hope we can keep on agreeing and disagreeing and using each other's conceptual and also political, like it, it's also in terms of praxis. Um, if I see how the work that Maria Mies did with the lace makers in Arsapur and how the, the, the methodological, the field work that she did and also the political engagements she had, um, you know, I take that with me when I when I sit in the in the house of a Georgian surrogate and try to have a conversation with her with how you know how she perceives of motherhood, how she perceives of of, of surrogacy babies, how she sees her relationship to the intended parents. I mean, this is something that I carry with me, um, and yeah, um, also in my in my organizing, like I'm I I I, I work a lot. I'm I'm active in quite a few feminist collectives where this, you know, women's waged and unwaged reproductive labor is really important uh, or where it's put center, center stage. And I would have not been able to do that um, without all my research on fertility, um, but neither without engaging with this, you know, with this very rich history and with these legacies of these amazing feminist uh, thinkers. So, yeah, I think I'm a bit of an old and a new um, feminist materialist and I hope you know, yeah, we can keep on learning from each other's work. Yeah, well, it's a, I think it's a very, very um, productive um, set of continuities within uh, feminist materialist analysis. Um, and we don't, we haven't, you know, really 
necessarily draw nearly as many connections to the study of new reproductive technologies as as we could. Um, and you you mentioned that Maria Meese was involved in Finrage, which of course she was, but it's also very interesting that um, I believe her very first article on the lace makers of Narsapur, which if I remember correctly was in Economic and Political Weekly, um, was published in 1978, um, you know, which was the same year, obviously, yeah. Louise Brown was born. And, you know, it's, it's kind of almost an interesting sort of thought experiment. You know, we don't think of Louise Brown as belonging to a reproductive industrial complex, and we don't think of her as belonging to the housewifeization of labor. But of course, you know, the world in 1978 on the brink you know, of Reaganism and Thatcherism on the brink of the sort of explosion of neoliberalism on the brink of so many critical geopolitical events, you know, was a very historically situated birth and like all births, you know, had the, had the world inside it as it were. Um, you've done such a brilliant job of showing that CD and um, your work on colonization, capitalization, industrialization, your theoretical work bringing together, you know, Wallerstein, feminist materialism, Sylvia Federici, with much more recent work with your colleagues in Spain um, and Britain and elsewhere. It's a very, very exciting model of the kind of work that's happening in the fertility field that is really transforming fertility, both as a site of investigation and as a lens through which to see other things. And I want to thank you very, very much for agreeing to participate in this event today um, and for agreeing to um, start us off on what I hope is a really exciting journey looking at feminist research on fertility today, where I think there's a huge number of lessons to be learned about um, how fertility affects us all. So thank you thank very you much. Sarah.